I'm recording. Ready. Cool. You're recording, bro? Mm-hmm. Awesome. All right, everyone. Welcome back to the Have It All podcast. It's got to be a good sign. Why? Because guys here too. Yeah. <laughs> That's how I know. I'm like, it's going to be great. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it's really interesting. Um, so first, let, let, let's welcome our guest. So Isabel Hunt's with us here today. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I'm totally honored that I have both of you. <laughs> yeah. So I'll tell you why that's funny, because in most cases, if it's someone that um, maybe I read their book or someone that I find interesting that we bring them on as an interviewer, or interviewee, then I tend to do it solo. Anytime mm-hmm. I meet someone and I'm like, bro, we would have an awesome conversation. So <laughs> that, that's how the three of us. So these end up being more of these kind of like go every which direction conversational type podcasts, which people really, really love. Sounds good to me. I'm up for it. <laughs> oh, yeah, I just realized though, this is uh, going to be like a slap in the face to every guest we're on that on. They're going to be like, oh, you must not really like me. So no. <laughs> now, now I'm going to have to come on as a point of integrity to make every guest feel special. <laughs> That's funny. That's well, funny. I definitely feel special. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. so, um, so Isabel, why don't you start by telling people what you're passionate about and what lights you up, what you're doing in the world, and then we'll, we'll dive in. All you. right. Sounds good. Well, um, as you already said, my name is Isabel Hunt. I'm a certified transformation coach as well as an author of the book, The Power of Faith-Driven Success. And since yesterday, Amazon bestselling author or co-author of the book, Unscripted, um, cool. How Women Thrive in Life, Business, and Relationships. So that was a really cool experience yesterday. Um, And I'm also an emotions clearing practitioner, so I work and teach and coach and speak on the topic of emotions pretty much all day long (laughs) and love that. And within my individual coaching um, practice, I work with empath, highly, highly sensitive people, but I also coined that term empath warrior, which are the intro extroverted people and not just the introverted people. And they're trying to figure out how to bring both of that together Mm -hmm. and create balance. So that's what I'm really passionate about. And I'm especially passionate about younger gener- the younger generations and helping them understand um, all about their nervous system and how they're overstimulating it and overloading it with information and helping them work through some of those mental health stigmas. When you're talking about that for the younger generation, just out of curiosity, what are the age groups that you're uh, doing this kind of instructional work with? The people that resonate with it with most are between 20 and 35. Hmm. Okay. Interesting. So not not that young. I was thinking. I was like, is she doing this stuff with four year olds? Uh, and well, yeah, I do actually. <laughs> I you need to teach him young to sure. get it. He's sure. really really good with it. Uh, I actually do. I speak to moms as well um, about how their emotional world um, influences their children mm-hmm. and how they react to their emotional state. And so, yes, actually, indirectly, I do. Yes, I work with young kids in that way. And I honestly, I had 16 year olds reach out to me asking me if I can be on their podcast. So that really is an honor. And that's my, yes, I do something right. (laughs) (laughs) Striking gold with the millennials. Yes. (laughs) Well, they're not millennials anymore. They're like the Generation Z. Like it's Oh, that's true. This is true. That's true. Yeah. You know, well, I don't know if you're a millennial. You might be, you might be at the tail end of Gen Y. I think I'm right, right at the end of it. Me too. Yeah, something like that. Uh, I don't know. Doesn't matter. It's Doesn't like matter. 35, 36. And- I, have a, humans. Go ahead. I have a question <laughs> for you. So um, emotional intelligence to me actually feels like the forefront of transformational work today. Oh, and, yes. Yeah, w- without a doubt. Um, and intelligence, understanding, all, all well and good, definitely has its place. Um, certainly there's a difference between understanding something and, and like knowing it, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I truly believe something can only be known through the body. So I just want to, for the people listening, uh, I think it's very easy for people to define emotional intelligence, however they see fit. I just want to kind of like use your definition as we're going through the experience. So, um, how would you define emotional intelligence? I would define emotional intelligence as spiritual experience. <laughs> um, I think you cannot separate emotions with spirituality and uh, I just actually yesterday I I talked about that and I should have looked up the story again but uh, um, many years ago when they started researching about emotions there was a um, a scientist and there was still that that 
conversation between um, science and church. And he said, I want to really take a look at emotions, how they're coming to be and how we can work with them. And so he had this conversation with the Pope and the Pope said, you're only allowed to do the physical um, research on emotions, not the spiritual, because Mm. even back then they already knew that they can use emotions as a manipulation tool to control people. And I need to look up the names, really. I, I'm so bad at remembering names. My brain is like, they say people who forget a lot, they're really intelligent, right? So I feel better. Um, <laughs> Crushing it. <laughs> so I feel better. Yeah, right. Everyone feels better now. We're good. Yeah. Um, especially when you're a parent, that you feel even better. You just get smarter. Um, but anyway, <laughs> so that's the story where they separated emotions from spirituality. And I think both goes together. So often when we hear emotional intelligence, it feels very scientific. And it kind of, when you read a lot of the scientific research, doesn't talk much about the spirituality in it. So for me, both of that really goes together and belongs together. I think it's very, very ironic, right? When, when teaching emotional intelligence, like you said, when, when the left brain scientific mind Mm. wants to understand it they ask the how do i questions and then you step out of the field of emotional intelligence to answer the question so it becomes like the emotional intelligence field is tends to be a little bit more paradoxical Um, it's also separated from each other and it's it's hard to for people to understand to actually understand how important it really is when you do separate it and compartmentalize it yeah uh, I was reading, uh, I'm, I'm reading because it's such a big book, um, Ken Wilber's book. It's called The Future of Religions. And uh, he separates um, like Eastern philosophy into like mm. uh, an advancement, enlightenment and states. And then kind of like the personal development, Western minded, Western religion into yeah. structures, right? So it's like a growing up process versus a uh, waking up process. Yes. And uh, one thing that he mentioned in there that, that you kind of touched upon, I found really interesting is how the church can't control states. They can control structures. They can tell you how to grow up. But when you start exploring states of consciousness, when you're having mystical experiences, like who knows where you're going to get, you know, take some psychedelic or go work with a powerful energy healer or a mystic of any kind. And you start exploring states, they, they can't control that. So the no. religion very much became a system of control. They moved away from the mystical kind of said, Hey, we're not going to do that anymore because we can't control it. Let's work on just teaching people exactly. how to grow up. We'll, we'll create the system. And that's kind of how it's been for, for quite a while. Right. And that's just ingrained in you. I see it now with so many clients that I work with that grew up in the church and have a really, really hard time stepping into that empathic gift that they have, like this, what we would call supernatural gift. And everyone has it, but everyone has it, has it developed differently within their physical body. And it's really hard for them to work through that doctrine of church and the structure and the, yeah, just church in general, really. I mean, I grew up Protestant and honestly, just talking about my work and I'm glad I don't know how to really talk about it in German because I think my parents <laughs> would freak out a little bit. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. My, my grandparents think I'm in a sect anyways. Uh, they, don't, they don't quite understand it. Sure. Um, but yeah, you definitely have judgment where they're like, that's not normal. You shouldn't have that experience. Like that's witchy, you know? I mean, yep. that's the reason why so many years back then, uh, witches were burned because they were afraid of the power that comes with that understanding, that deeper connection, that soul level connection. Yes. Isabel, I'm curious, you know, when people come to you Mm -hmm. to work with you, what are their goals? So, you know, like emotion is a big topic and I don't believe, I could be wrong. I don't believe you work with people like, you know what? I just feel bad. Like it's a lot and I, and I really want to make that point here because people might hear, well, does she work with people who are just depressed or what? So like, I'm curious when people are working with you, what is the goal um, that they're looking to obtain? How oh, to do it, like really get it down to it. It's that peace within. Um, what happens with most of the people that I work with is that they just want to hide, but at the same time, they feel this really bad urge to go out. They have a bigger message and they know it and it doesn't go away. It's even hard to describe. Those who hear me talk, they know what I'm talking about. That's pretty much how I get all my clients. When they hear me talk, I'm like someone gets me, someone understands. 
it's like this inner fire, something that is so much bigger, but they can't. It's like they're imprisoned. Uh, they want to hide underneath the bed with the cover over them and the doors locked. Um, but it's always something that says, go out, go out, go out. And so they can't um, balance the the um, introvert with the extrovert like I had problems in the beginning being on stage because I was able to read everyone's thoughts that are coming at me almost mm -hmm. like spears and you're like oh, I can't I can't and then you have all those brain farts and you're like what did I want to talk about again because your brain is so overstimulated from trying to pick up everything that's coming at you that it just can't do the work that it was supposed to do on stage. So um, those are usually the people that just like, yep, that's me, that's me. I don't have to do much. People just come to me. It's like, I, I know exactly that you get me. So it's like that introvert within that extrovert, they always know. And often some of those side effects are um, depression, anxiety, a lot of anxiety. Um, often they are on medications or they have been diagnosed with ADHD or autism. Um, functional autism, of course. Otherwise, they wouldn't have that understanding, the knowledge about it. Um, some of them have already, um, it, they have considered suicide because it just got so loud, so noisy in their head. And when they hear me speak, they're like, I need to talk to you because I, I know you get me. Mm. So a few things that came up for me, you, you had mentioned this ability as like supernatural and it, it's funny because mm -hmm. we, we use language um, like outside the realm of normality, except yeah. that as you step into this field, you realize it could not be more normal. Like there's so many people experiencing yeah. uh, high levels of aptitude when it comes to empath, emotional acuity. Uh, acuity. I, I would even gather to say it's not that big of a stretch to say somebody dealing with autism is one of the highest level empaths we probably have on the planet. I would um, agree. Years ago, there was a, um, they brought a shaman, I don't remember where, but to, to like a psych ward in the United States. And the shaman was baffled about why the people were locked up. Mm -hmm. And when they asked him why, he said, these are all your great mystics. He said, these yeah. are all your gifted ones. You're the ones supposed to be showing you the way <laughs> and you've yeah. locked them all up. Um, so uh, to kind of uh, go back to what you were saying about um, uh, like people whose emotional body is way out here and they're being inundated. Like I, I don't, I don't want to call it degrees because I don't really know how they measure who's doing what, but certainly there's people who, who can really tap in and yeah. all sorts of different things that to most people would just seem freaky and weird, but I'm around those people so much that I, I see how normal it actually is. <laughs> um, so somebody comes to you, cause this is like, a, I really think where practicality comes in. Like I've been dealing with this most of my life. I get it extremely Thank inundated you. by, by people's energy fields. If I watch two people arguing, even in the distance, it's as if one of them is arguing with me. Like I'm actually mm -hmm. like processing and dealing with the, that emotional state. So it's taken me years, uh, psychedelics, pursuit of many, many things to even find small ways of finding, like you said, that inner peace, because mm -hmm. I, I don't, it, it's just a constant disruption. It's a constant anxiety. And so like somebody comes to you and, and I think most people don't realize that is that their energy field has their emotional body and this emotional body is kind of absorbing everything and you're dealing with it. How, how does one who's dealing with that state and it, it's what in Western society people call sensitivity mm -hmm. instead of looking at it like the gift that it is. We're like, Oh, you're sensitive. You're vulnerable. It's like, yeah, yeah you're gifted as hell. Um, what do you tell someone like that so that they can, I don't want to use the word control, at least manage what's coming through in a mm -hmm. way that's usable for them. Um, what I have experienced with my own clients and with, with myself as well is that at some point you have to become the observer. Uh, how I explain it to them is for one, I teach people simple ways to protect themselves energetically. It could be as simple as grounding, going outside and putting your feet in the dirt or having a grounding mat. Like I'm sitting here at my desk, there's a mat underneath my desk. I'm sitting, I like I'm standing on it all okay. the time. Mm -hmm. Um, other things is my, my son, he's an empath too. He loves to hug trees. Like that helps him to feel safe. Mm -hmm. Really all it is, is going back to feeling safe. That is where it get, goes back to. As long as people feel safe, you are not taking on everyone else's crap. Uh, because your own elect bioelectromagnetic, bioelectromagnetic field is high. 
um, as long as your own frequency is high, you don't tend to take on everyone else's stuff. The lower it is, the more you're taking it on. So just helping people to raise their vibration already helps them to become more of the observer. I always explain it with the matrix. I have not watched the movie. I just always see the... Um, what? <laughs> I know. I probably should. I should. Don't, don't judge me. Don't so good. <laughs> I know, I but um, you can experience it like that slow motion. You see how everything is coming at you and you can literally just move away from it or you can yeah. just acknowledge it saying, okay, this far and not further and we're good. And you, like I have um, prayers that my coach has given me. One is like, I co-create with the divine that all things alien and conditional leave my mind, body and spirit at once and return to the rightful place with divine will love and grace. I bless them and so be it. That's something I say all day long and I already taught it to my son because when I do feel attacked, I can say that right away and it mm. literally just turns around and goes back to where it was coming from and then I can watch. The thing is, um, people who have those gifts also have a very high responsibility to society. Uh, there is just a, a, a deeper sense of responsibility that we have for humanity. And if you're always feeling attacked, you cannot step into that place of transformation within the world society. We're not just here for us. You feel that responsibility. Like if someone would tell me today, you have to quit your, your business, unless it is really something serious within my family, I would tell them, I just can't, no matter how much I want to, I can't. Like there is this connection where it, it wouldn't even let me. And the more you feel attacked, the less you can actually step into that and the less you understand your message. So I, I really start out with very simple exercises that they can implement on a daily basis. Um, it, I created a protection prayer, uh, like sip up exercise. I'm sure you guys heard of that with the meridians. Um, simple things that make them feel safe. And if you feel safe, you watch where your frequency is going. And when you feel safe, you're also more aware of your emotional state. Yeah, so good. I, uh, I actually just right before we got on here, I was uh, on with one of our coaches. And we also work on the energy body systems, yeah. but not from a conceptual process. So a lot of coaches, I mean, we do some of this stuff too. It, it's conceptual. You know, you're walking through people like, I feel this and this is my belief. And then you kind of help them reprogram it. This is just completely different. This is like someone going into your, if you watch the matrix, like going into the actual system, the computer program yes. without your, I mean, you're there, you're fear, feeling it and experiencing it. And it's just like upgrades, like things are being removed, things are being plugged in, like half the time you have no idea what the hell's happening. Right. Um, and one of the things we actually spoke about afterwards was how in life, everyone's kind of, you said like the electro bio uh, system has different frequencies. Yeah. So like mine, for example, I'm, I push energy out. So in essence, like I affect people, mm -hmm. right? So where the majority of people are actually affected by people. So like yes. they go out into the world, they are constantly affected by people. I'm one of the affectors. Me What's too. really interesting and I never really uh, understood it is because like Guy, for example, is constantly affected. Like he's, he's been doing amazing work even recently to be able to move the the body and like actually kind of like where you say avoid that stuff. Mm -hmm. For me though, that was also a defense mechanism because if I expand yes. my energy out in a real out in a really big way, it doesn't actually allow for other energy to come in. So everything yeah. has its strengths and, and weaknesses to it. What we spoke about today, which was super interesting, is there's like a cultural gravitational pull that mm -hmm. everyone has certain beliefs about how emotional, how emotions affect them. They have certain beliefs about life, et cetera. And so what you're talking about now and some of the work that we do, it's really important to get to that stabilized, almost like gravitational pull. Cause yeah. otherwise the cultural pull, the gravitational pull of society strong. is so strong that you could do these things that, you know, make you feel safe. And then you go out to the environment and because that frequency isn't stabilized, 
all of a sudden people get sucked down. And then, mm-hmm. and this is really the, the, the point uh, I want to drive home here. It's like, I think people disregard the power of this work and disregard the value of patience oh, when yeah. doing this work. You've been programmed for 20, 30, 40 years with a certain energy body, with certain beliefs, with certain actions, et cetera. And then even I find myself, I'm like, I want to do, you know, I'll work with my coach. I'm like, okay, just show me how to do that. He's like, you know, it's taken people like 30, 40 years sitting in a cave meditating to get to that state. Like, I I love that you want it. And, you know, it might just take a little bit of time. So I think it's really important for people to understand that this is just a process. And and what Isabel is talking about, like all these little uh, practices, I have my own also, really help start you down that path of reprogramming Mm -hmm. what is safe. Because the body has completely different triggers to what is safe than what your mind does. So like you'll go out, you'll feel really brave. You're like, okay, I'm going to do that thing. And then the body just reacts. (laughs) When that, yeah. When that usually happens to me, then I know, Oh, I didn't protect myself adequately before I left. I was just kind of dabbling along. Uh, Yeah, totally. And for me, like even when I'm in a crowd now, I am at this point now where I can literally from within create almost like a a bubble that is expanding. And it doesn't mean that I can't connect with people anymore, but it feels almost like I can just keep it out and I can just watch. Like you said, you become the observer. Mm -hmm. And having that balance between two, it's actually interesting to have both of you there because there is a balance between what you both experience. Very much, yeah. And um, it feels like that I could be that balance thing in the middle, that maybe that's the reason why we're all three here. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but it's interesting. You are able to create that balance, but it takes a lot of awareness. And I tell people, just because you worked with me for four or five months doesn't mean you have that down just because you say you have a quick awakening process doesn't mean you can't, you, you stop at some point and you yes. just, oh yeah, I'm at this awakening stage and now I'm good. Yeah. That's not happening. You just will crash like really, really fast. And even when I teach about emotions, I don't, I mean, okay, yeah, every emotion has a specific meaning, but what I, what I tell people is more about the, the self, um, self-discovery process. So I just give them an, a questions to ask when certain emotions show up so they can create their own system. Like what is this emotion telling me specifically? Yeah. And what, what is usually the result from that? Or what am I supposed to do moving forward from that emotion? And that has helped people to really stay on their own path. And it's hard. I mean, we know it globally. We'll all come closer together. There are so many people that tell you what to do. I mean, when I even started out with my business, like you said, the social pull, right? Gosh, I I lost over $50,000 because I thought this is what I'm supposed to do. Mm -hmm. I didn't trust my intuition. And now I'm like, you don't have to sell me. If if I know this is for me, I will make it work no matter how much it costs me. If it's not for me, I tell you no. And then you just have to live with it because you don't change my mind about it. Mm-hmm. But that's the power of intuition. And that's something everyone can learn and practice. And then again, if you're an empath, you have to practice it even more because again, there's so much more that affects you. Absolutely. There's so much. What was that last line? There's so much even more that affects you mm. from the outside. I imagine what you, what you're training on, um, you know, it's, it's so important because if you're, um, Bro, you're, you're coming in very faint again. Oh, am I? Hold on. Let me mm. try to change this. Cause I did change something. I think it'd be better. All right. See, so yeah, is that any better? Say it again. Is that better? I think a little bit. Okay. I don't know why that is. All right. Uh, I was going to say like, you know, part, part of the gift that I think of what you're training on and you can correct me if I'm wrong is, that, that field allows you to, like you said, observe what's happening and then volunteer it in versus have it come in in like yes. an intrusive type of way. Um, yeah, I think this is right now, uh, honestly, I think I, at the forefront of maybe the, at least for me, what's most interesting. Um, I, I'm a really, we're, we love Osho, like we love his teachings, uh, even mm-hmm. if you don't love everything about his life, I love the teachings. And um, he was using the word uh, intuition and he broke it down and he said, tuition, right? Like you pay someone to teach you when you're intuiting, what are you, what are you doing? You're, you're, you're teaching from within, right? You're teaching the self. I think part of what's, what's really interesting is 
I think everyone gets to get to a point where the mind surrenders the need to understand. Like your, your, yes. your, your emotions don't always make sense. You can put on protection then go somewhere and part of your system somewhere in the background, you hear something that doesn't actually land in the consciousness, but the subconscious picks up and the, a little thing starts triggering in your body, like an uneasiness or something that's uncomfortable and it bubbles up. And before you know it, you're like, why do I feel like I'm, you know, feeling restrained over here or my chest is tight or something like that. And, mm -hmm. and a lot of people, because they, um, aren't attuned to listening to this, this is eventually what leads to things like panic attacks and psychotic Reacting. episodes yeah. and depression. And certainly for me, like I was someone who dealt with depression and suicide. I remember it mm -hmm. like coming up through my system until it just overtook. And when there's not awareness, this is like the danger of it, right? It, is yeah. it can turn, it can turn very, very dark on people. So you, uh, you mentioned a uh, exercise, a uh, SIP is what you called it. The sip up exercise. Yeah. yeah. Can you, can you describe that just cause uh, maybe we use a different term or perhaps we don't even know about it. Yeah. That is when you, um, literally sip up your meridian energy. <laughs> um, it where you pretend like there's a sipper in front of you in the middle mm. of your body that starts right above your pubic bone and it goes all the way up to your upper lip and you just literally sip it up for three times and you breathe in while you do that. And then you breathe out. Um, that keeps the balance within your meridians. Love it. It's yeah. very simple. Um, it's pretty well known within the theta healing um, area that where people work with theta healing, they use that a lot. Mm -hmm. So it has helped me tremendously, especially when I started out with this work. I mean, in the beginning, I didn't even know what that meant to be an empath. I just knew I'm really intuitive. And for me, everything is just in color. Like um, we already talked about a lot of that um, earlier, where everything I receive, my brain turns into color and every color because of a specific frequency has a specific meaning and I can, I can read the messages behind that. Mm. So I often do like intuitive color readings, but um, it, it's really simple and it's, it's scientifically um, explainable, which is quite interesting to people how that really works. Uh, but yeah, people always like, can you read my mind now? Can you do it? I was like, I, I <laughs> not to. I could, but that would be invasion into your personal space because it's ethically not okay for me to tune in with you unless you ask me to. Yeah. Yeah. I can see the outside, like there are different levels, right, of what we can see. I can see the color maybe, but I will not tune in deeper what the message is behind that unless someone asks me. Um that's something else. Like we, we have all those energy healers now and everyone is like, I have this gift too. I can, I can do this too. And then, I'll, and then like in my group, I have to be very cautious with my people. I was like, do you do not tune in with people unless they ask you to Absolutely. like, I tuned in with you. And this is what came out. I was like, did she ask you? I don't think she did. Yeah. Um, so it's interesting how, how you can work that. But I think if we really take a look, all of us have this ability um, to an extent, but there are so many different things that have influenced us. We talk about, um, I talk about trapped emotions a lot, uh, the trapped energy within your body. It could still be from generations of generations. Sure. That's where like from like slavery, for example, that's why, why, um, black people have a lot of shame issues, shame and guilt build up within them. It's not even them today. It's still ingrained from all those, um, generations of generations before them i had one client where i released trapped emotions he was always anxious he said i don't know where it's coming from but i know my grandfather has anxiety my dog my my dad has anxiety and so we took a look and it was inherited and once we released it he's like i haven't had it in quite a while and it feels good i'm almost yeah. waiting for it to show up so everyone is at a different level. Everyone has gone through a different journey and it is not your, just your physical journey. It is your soul journey from generations ago that comes literally with you into your physical body. And it's proven like we know that today um, scientifically. And so everyone is on a different journey. And, but I think really to the core, we all have those abilities. Yeah, guy had a crazy experience with 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 all of that uh, with Sandra, right? Yeah, with Sandra. I mean, uh, I was going to say, uh, I, I actually don't know anybody who's not an empath. I think you may have dulled your mm -hmm. gifts for whatever reasons. When do you meet a child that you don't look and think that child is sensitive or that they're receiving information from their parents 
that mm-hmm. whether it's being said or not, the child is certainly receiving it. I, it would make sense to me. That's how we actually send down genetic uh, yep. information to one another. And we do it in a lot of different ways, but certainly energy bodies are one of them. Um, I, I mean, I've had, I could literally pick about five experiences for every single thing you guys shared so far. I, I remember we first started working with um, the guy we work with today, who's a really talented, I would say quite awakened man mm-hmm. and has the levels of sensitivity that I've never experienced before with another human being. Like you have a thought, he's like, always knows exactly what's going on in your system. And when I first, (laughs) and when I, when I first started working with him, my my energy can also, I can push out really far. I did a Vipassana about two and a half years ago and got a really, it's like a 10 day silent meditation. Yeah. And and during that time you sit in silence, gifts are coming online. Like you sit and meditate 12 hours a day. You're going to notice all sorts of things you never, never noticed before. And I started feeling my energy field. I'm like, Oh wow, I can move it. I could shape it. I can put it here, put it there. So we first started working together, your system, especially when you're working with like a new educator or mentor, or someone mm-hmm. who's going to, you know, give you, I don't want to call it advice, but opening for new doorways, your system's going to do what your system always does. It's going to check in. It's going to yeah. look, all your protectors are going to come out and be like, is this okay? Is this safe? And mostly our system can't take big gulps of anything. It just needs little sips, right? Like we can't just go boom, boom. Yep. And it's actually not, not great for the system to make such big shifts so rapidly. So my system, when it gets an alert, uh, I've, I've trained it to go into other people's system and like almost go through their Rolodex to basically see if they're full of shit or not. With what they're <laughs> telling me. So I get over, I get over there and maybe it was like session one, session two. Yeah. And he said something and my system got alerted and I feel my energy body just like kind of like move into his. And in my mind, I'm like, I start noticing all the things about his body, you know, like, uh, uh, mm-hmm. just how it's being held and all sorts of things. And I see him go, whoa, whoa, whoa. he goes, whoa, 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 he goes, he goes, get out. <laughs> he goes, because you are literally flying through my system, like a Rolodex like this, just yeah. like, be apart. And he goes in there, it actually got in there and made, you know, like alerted his system. So it was really interesting for me to watch as my system kind of protected itself or how, one of the ways it protected itself. Um, and, and to Elon's point, a, a few months ago, I sat with this woman who I'm actually going to go do a uh, intensive with in, in July this woman, Sandra, who can basically go into your body at the quantum field, wow. uh, but also like go back through lifetimes and all sorts of stuff. Mm-hmm. And what's really interesting about what she does is not only can she go and see the programs and yank them out, she shows you in real time through kinesiology that your program is, is changing. So like she'll like test you and yeah, like, like rapid fire testing. You have to see it, how amazing this is. And you're just like so weak. So she found this story like... um I could tell like I'm, I'm a very old soul. I've been an educator and a teacher, like a mentor for, for spiritual practice for a very, very long time. She finds this program where I was like a high priest in like somewhere in the Middle East. And um, I, I led this congregation essentially. And at some point these crusaders come and just murder everyone in front of me. Mm. And, and, and that leaves a stain in your system. Like if you yeah. love people, they get hurt. And that's kind of been very the story of my life. I feel like very alone and kind of abandoned, but I want to really help everybody. And there's a lot of love there. And it was just amazing because she tests, um, whether it's like spiritual, mental, emotional, um, past lifetimes. And she's like, it's all five, whatever, whatever five she tests for. Mm-hmm. I tested like week on all five and she pulls this program out and you just literally watch my hand just get stronger and stronger as she's yanking it. Um, and I think it was the first time after that happened that I could authentically say the word God without some, one, some part of my system going like, <gasps> like Interesting. And, and it's always kind of been a fight for me uh, in that way. And I never quite understood why, because I'm, I'm, a, I'm very attracted to all that. Right. Yeah. yeah. So it was just ah. incredible. Yeah. That is really interesting. Yeah, I have one client. She can she can literally um, cut off my thoughts. If she if I get, take her to a place where she doesn't want to go, she draws blank in my brain. Like literally, it's almost like she's pulling the curtain. And I was like, "Stop it! You still have to go there. Stop!" I know exactly what I was going to say, and it literally I I draw blank when she does that. If there are places where she doesn't want to go, she goes within and just draw a blank and like I don't know where I wanted to go with you right now and he's like wow. okay but she wasn't aware of it and so I had to tell him I was like you have this ability to go into my mind literally and, and cut me off 
if there are places where you don't want to go. And okay. now she's more aware of it. And she's a, actually, she's a web designer, which is really fun because that's how she is really successful with her branding, with her clients, because she also is very drawn to color. And that's how she creates the, the brand according to what she receives energetically, which is really fun. And, um, that's, that's how pretty much my brand ended up being like this orange yellow because yellow I'm just totally drawn to. And um, it, it's, it's really fascinating work. And the more you see it more and more with younger people that seem to resonate with it, where it's like, I feel this. And I think that's also one reason why we see the minimalist movement within younger people, because the more you're spiritually connected, the less you want. Yes. You don't need anything like we do. Like I could sit in an empty room and I would be perfectly happy. Mm -hmm. I don't need a big house. I don't need a big car as long as I get around. I could literally sit in my backyard all day and be okay with that. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting where people say, well, um, you don't have this big house. So how successful is your business really? It's like, I don't need it. I don't want it. I rather go and, and buy off a huge portion of land just to protect it. <laughs> um, <laughs> That's actually more what I'm drawn to than actually buying stuff for me. I'm constantly getting rid of stuff. My husband is the same way. And my son, too, he doesn't care about toys. He is like, I don't need it. I don't want it. I'd rather just play out in the dirt. I'm like, yes, thank God. I don't want to. <laughs> We've gotten you a new pile of dirt here. <laughs> mulch, play yeah. in it. Maybe not yeah. that. D dig, <laughs> dig a hole here, then dig a hole there. Uh, Isabel, I'm curious what your take is. Obviously, we're talking about a lot about kind of the new kids coming in. I know you have a four-year-old. Um, I have two. I have a six and a half and a four-year uh, and a five-year-old. And there's just a difference in the mm -hmm. way that these young children are coming in and coming online. And I think a lot of the things that we as adults uh, have been working on for you know years to try to almost revive or remember that we came here with mm -hmm. um, they almost seem to be coming online with them already kind of like the program's already there yeah um, and I find it really interesting like as a father that it's something that we really I, I have made it my responsibility to highlight these gifts in these children where I think a lot of the people that you work with for a long time, whether it's schools or by parents, were told that the way that they are was wrong and that they yeah. need to do this, this, and this. And because of that, it's kind of put blockages and caps on all of these incredible, incredible gifts. And then you go to somewhere like where Guy is in San Diego and it's just filled with wizards and witches and magicians and like all these people who've just given up that bullshit story and have really let their gifts come online. And they don't care how it sounds or whether it's too woohoo or hokey or whatever, like to them it's real and they, they've been able to do incredible things. I'm curious with kids what you're noticing and if there's any advice either as a practitioner or a parent mm -hmm. that you could share with the listeners about how to actually uh, help these people and so, uh, these kids and support their gifts versus what we've done in the past. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I need to move for one. I need to move to San Diego, I guess. Yeah. The Midwest gonna, is not I'm so great. The moment we started talking, I'm like, just move to San Diego. I don't know what they're doing in Indianapolis, but oh, no, Midwest. I mean that's the, the Bible belt, right? Or we're, we're talking about people look at me weird sometimes. I think that's one reason why why people withdraw from us a lot. <laughs> But we actually want to move to North Carolina to the mountains because Asheville is similar to San Diego, which is yeah, um, another hot spot. And, but to your children, uh, what I have realized, the difference that it makes is to always treat them as individual, not as child-adult relationship, but as human versus human. Yeah. And taking seriously what they say and how they speak and what they express. The first thing is, and we do that as parents, and I know I do that too, but when your kid comes downstairs and is crying or is upset about something, the first thing we ask is, what is wrong with you, right? Yeah. What is wrong? And that already instills in them that the way I feel, there's something wrong with me. Right. Yeah. And so I don't ask that anymore. We have really trained, and again, sometimes it comes through, uh, but we, we really train ourselves to ask, what do you need? And even my four-year-old is already very much aware of his needs. For example, we went to the store and we, we, we walked to the car 
And he looks at me, he's like, mommy, I suddenly feel very, very sad. And I don't know where it's coming from. And I was like, I'm sorry, buddy. Uh, and then I went down on my knees and looked at him and I said, okay, what, what do you need right now? What do you think where this is coming from? And he's like, I think that was a sad person in the store. Mm. Can you just give me a hug or I just need a kiss? All they need is to feel safe. And children feel safe when you treat them as equal and not as authority versus you are the child and you have nothing to say. Wow. I listen to my son so much because he literally creates the business with me. He guides me. He leads mm -hmm. me with so many things that he says. Like today, um, I posted on Facebook. He was looking at me and is like, Mommy, you know, God is always providing us with money. Sometimes it even falls from the sky. Wow. <laughs> and then he found a quarter piece on the floor. It's like, you're really good at that manifesting thing. It's like, I wow. know, it's just there. Wow. God always gives us what we need, right? Yes. And I know I say that a lot to him, but just having that awareness in a four-year-old, I'm so cynical. I was like, I wish I would have this internal knowing and believing because sometimes we still, as an adult, we question it. Like, oh, it's not showing up. So, well, whatever. It's probably not true. You know, those internal stories that you have. So I think for, for parents in general is to acknowledge everything they experience. Like, even if they talk about their friends um, ghost friends around them. My, my son has that a lot. Don't just dismiss it. Really ask them, what do they look like? What do they say? How do they appear? If they say, oh, they're friends, they're really nice to me, then just tell them, okay, they're spirits and they sometimes try to interact with us. So if you don't want to, here's what you can say. Like to my son, I say, you just say in Jesus' name, I demand for them to leave my room and never to come back. Mm. But there was an instant where he was like really aggressive and not listening and it's so not him and i was like okay who is with you and so he explained it and he made really creepy faces this is how this part how this ghost looks like um or whatever he said i don't know how we called it this this boy and i was like okay that is not a good spirit to be with um he is trying to scare you and trying to make you do things that you don't want to do and once we went through a prayer he, it never showed up again. He was like, no, it's gone. I feel better now. I feel safe. And then his whole demeanor changed too. And I know that from so many other people and clients that I work with that have children that go through something sim similar with their children. Sure. So it's all about taking them seriously, acknowledging what they go through, no matter how crazy it seems to you or how much you wish yeah. it wouldn't be the case. But just the acknowledgement makes them feel safe and feeling safe has them open up to you. And then they tell you what's going on and you can respond to it. If it sounds creepy to you, find someone um, who can support you with that and kind of make more sense of it because not everyone is into the woo woo stuff, how we call it. But it really is just spirituality. It's not organized religion. It is that deep connection with your soul. And especially if you have highly sensitive children, they're like lighthouses. Yeah. They literally attract all of it, but their little body doesn't know what to do with it physically. So it's overstimulation. And then it leads to chaos, not being able to sleep, not um, listening, throwing tantrums. Some of them even wet their bed constantly because of your body doesn't know what to do anymore. And there are just simple ways to do things like a prayer that supports them. My son loves to sleep now. Like he had so many problems with sleeping because there were always things showing up in his, mm. in, in his dreams. And when it was dark, he still doesn't like to sleep in the dark because of it. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I spoke to so many people that were intuitive and, and could talk to souls and see energies and all that stuff. And I always ask them this question because what I find really interesting is that as a human being, we all have this where we see the world. We, we think that everyone else sees the world the way that we see the world. Mm -hmm. So I know for us, you know, we obviously do a lot of work. So we have that little bit of gap where we can sometimes take a pause and go, Oh wait, this person isn't viewing this from my perspective, which then mm -hmm. gives you the ability to actually have compassion and empathy and not get all dragged into that. Um, and then with kids, you know, we chalk it up a lot of the times to like, oh, you know, stop being silly. Yeah. And in talking to some of these people, I realized, oh, wow, like when, when kids are younger, they haven't had those gifts, quote unquote, beat out of them yet or told them that they're not, they're not yeah. good or they're being crazy or whatever it is. And so 
um, my daughter is, she's just like a fairy. I mean, she is just jumps around, singing, dancing, colors everywhere, et cetera. And so I just started asking, getting really interested about, you know, what do you see? Like today, for example, we were walking down to school and she's like, Abba, follow the light, follow the light. And like, you know, to oh, me, there's no light. Like I, I'm, you know, and she sees light on the, on the floor following. And so where I used to go would be like, I either not respond or be like, what are you talking about? There's no light to now just getting really interested. Like yeah. what light, where's the light, what color is the light and stuff like that. And it, to your point, it helps them validate that their experience is real. Mm-hmm. I was just reading in a, in a book about how everything that we do as a parent can either validate or invalidate. And it was sharing the story about how this girl and it, and we, we don't invalidate on purpose. We invalidate because we have insecurity and we feel unsafe and we want to make sure our children feel safe. And so it's this cycle, but they, they share this really extreme example, which I thought was really beautiful. Like this girl, they're walking down their block and um, there was a, a dog that got hit by hit and run. So it's, it's dead, it's bloodied, all this stuff. And the parents freak out. So the mom runs her inside the house, right? Mm-hmm. Meanwhile, the dad clean, like, gets rid of the dog, cleans all the blood, all that stuff. And they bring the daughter back out to the same spot to show her Mm -hmm. to be like, Oh no, you didn't, uh, what you thought you saw, wasn't real. And they were like, I get that, that you think you're doing for the, what's best for your daughter by protecting her. But literally what you've done is just invalidate that everything she sees now is in question. So her vision isn't even validated and accurate. And so then she grows up with all that stuff. And, at the end of the day, every single one of us as transformed and, and enlightened as we think we are, you know, when it comes to parenting, like <laughs> there are going to to be many, many things that we program <laughs> into our children that all of oh, us. Yeah. And I just think bringing that awareness with these beings who I, I strongly believe that our generation was just brought here to kind of be the bridge because the generation that's older than us is very has very very different outlook on life oh i get the most pushback from them yeah yeah so i feel like we're almost like the the cleaning unit you know to like clear some of the conversations and the things that have happened so that these Mm -hmm. children can come into this world and really i believe do the work that that is meant to be done and um yeah i just it's something that I'm really passionate about. And I love that you're, you're a mom and also teaching this to your son. It's just beautiful. I love what you just said, because I want to share with you a vision that I had while I wrote my book. I had a couple different visions, but one of them was that I saw people like us um, about similar age. I couldn't quite tell. I, I just saw uh, like people like thinking like us next to each other. And it was almost like um, rolling over this earth, like a wave cleaning up. And Mm -hmm. now when you just said that, that was exactly the vision that I saw. And um, even my chiropractor, he is our age too. And he's like, I think we're going to be the generation that actually helps the younger generation to, to step up to the plate and to really make a difference. I think we're the ones who are in the middle. So you're not the only one who thinks that, which is really amazing. And um, another vision that I had was that I had in front of me, like thousands and thousands of people that you would consider criminals and terrorists. Like it was really scary. They were like so angry and I could feel it. And I was like, I don't know what I'm supposed to do in front of them. They're going to kill me. That is not working. Like I had so much anxiety come up and I couldn't stop the vision. And all I heard was tell them you see them. Mm-hmm. And so I, I just said, I just said it out loud. I was like, okay, I see you. I, I see your heart. This is not you, what you show to the world. And suddenly I saw everyone in front of me just literally fall down on their knees crying, almost like a release and, um, and, and then I was able to stop the vision. I was like, this is exactly what we're here for, to see the heart of the people. And that's why I say the gift that I have is for me being able to read people's hearts. Like for me, it doesn't matter what you look like, what you do, uh, where you're from, because my brain doesn't go there very often. I have my bias and I'm, I'm human. You know, we have, we have our prejudice. Yeah. <laughs> I have my opinions, obviously. Sure. I'm not perfect, 
Sure. And I'm getting angry too, and, and you are not perfect. listening you're just, to my own. <laughs> you're, you're perfectly imperfect. Imperfect. Oh, there we go. Um, but for me, it's like looking at the heart. And with that vision, I think this is where, where our generation, especially, is coming in. We are the ones who are standing in the gap. And I say that to the people that I work with, especially those I consider as empath warriors. You're standing in the gap. And sometimes it gets really messy because you have both of those sides coming at you or over you. But unfortunately, you get the raw eggs and the tomatoes thrown at um, because you're in the middle. And so it takes very strong-willed people that really can stand and say, okay, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I can still stand strong and I can and I have the foundation to do this work. And that's why it's so important that um, especially millennials and um, Generation Y, that's what's before, right? Um, uh, that they learn to, to really trust their intuition so they can be strong and they can understand um, where this is going almost from an outside perspective. And that's why I cannot give up this work at any time, no matter what people would say. If someone sure. would, like, even if my husband would come and say, I'm leaving you because you're doing this work, I'm like, okay, I, I can't shut it off. I just can't. He wouldn't. He's an impact yeah. to you. Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're like the perfect team. Sure. But, um, you know, like, but that is that's something to understand for our generation that we have this um, responsibility. And I think this is why we're, go we're, driving away from the money-driven businesses or the money-driven influence, mm -hmm. the purpose-driven influence. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the biggest growing sector in business today is for a benefit. Yeah. By, by far, like leaps and bounds. I want to just highlight something here that you guys have been talking about. It's just It all comes back to safety. Mm -hmm. the, the human system for, man, as far back as history, if we can tell, has not experienced safety. So, okay. you know, Isabel, what you're doing with your son is so beautiful because – child rearing before was about obedience. It was about mm -hmm. breaking the child, like breaking, breaking a wild animal. And even that today, we're seeing how detrimental that's been to our relationship with nature. So it's like, there hasn't been a system for children to, to grow up and say, mommy, I'm scared. And for the parents not to say, what are you scared about? You know, and, and it's like, how does that create system, safety in the system more than safety intellectually, right? Like, yeah. and, and this is what everyone gets to understand now is like, like if, if you don't feel safe in your body, then you're not going to feel safe walking out into the world. Like mm -hmm. this is your sovereign space. This is your temple. This is your holy place. If in here you're scared shitless, then everywhere is going to be that and, and multiplied many, many times over why so many of us are dealing with overwhelm and anxiety and whatnot. We, mm -hmm. we legitimately have just not learned safety. So you said we're in this gap and you know, you might have tomatoes thrown at you which I think is kind of cute and lovely and can actually make us feel really safe because here's the thing. If they're just throwing tomatoes now, like, thank God, because once you used to say this stuff, they would call you a witch, put a cinder block around your foot and throw you into the ocean That's or, exactly right. or put you in a guillotine or in a line where they shot you or a million different things. Like we're not really dealing with that much today. The repression we're dealing with is a lot of pressure from media. Oftentimes it's just a few people saying something stupid that, our media yeah. chooses to highlight it and magnify what they're saying. It's like the pressures of this world have actually diminished quite a bit. It's never been safer to be a human being. We're living longer than we've ever lived before. People have come out of poverty and, and hordes. Like like the, the evolution, revolution, everyone's waiting for it. Guys, we're, we're here. It's a, we're in the midst of it right now. It's, it's already in process. It's already happening. Yeah. So it's like right now, that's what we got to deal with is that you reincarnated into this life. And it's finally safe. It's finally safe. It's, it's the only thing safe. is we try to make it unsafe so we can find something again that makes us feel safe. Totally. And I think right now it's especially the environmental problem. We only function when we're balanced and we're only balanced if nature is balanced. So the, the mm -hmm. more nature is unbalanced and environment, the more we are unbalanced and the more we are unbalanced, the less we can do the work that we're called to. That is now our enemy and our struggle and so it's funny how people create almost subconsciously on purpose unsafe situations to have to find something that makes them safe because finding that something gives them purpose absolutely well th there's a lot of things about why they would do that and it's really interesting because mm -hmm. i think that's the cycles that you know when we're coaching people i think the first place any human being can look whether it's doing emotional work uh, more of the, you know, consciousness type awakening work, et cetera, is to look for the patterns. 
I think we are so subconsciously programmed that life is a certain way. And when you just take like a half a step back and just look at your life from just a little bit of an elevation and go, okay, what are the patterns? Like over the last year, Mm -hmm. three years, five years, 10 years, what are the things that that keep happening? Am I self-sabotaging my business? Am I self-sabotaging my relationships? Does money seem to come and go in my life? Do I keep staying at the same exact level? Is my boss always the same? Is my uh, Mm -hmm. relationship with my kids always the same? And then like when you bring a little bit of personal responsibility, you can start to realize it's just my stuff that's creating it. I've been there for every single one of those bosses and every single one of those jobs and every, like you're the key denominator in all of it. And I think once you understand that, it it's at least gives you a good place to look from mm-hmm. to start to figure out what kind of work calls to you. Um, so Isabel, we are, uh, unfortunately, look at that. When you have fun, it, yeah, time, time goes really, really, really fast. <laughs> Um, I would love for you to share with our audience where they can find out more about you and what you do. Mm-hmm. Um, the easiest way really is to go to my website, isabahunt.com. Um, hunt, H-U-N-D-T, people forget the D. Mm. Um, <laughs> thank to my husband. Uh, thanks to my husband. <laughs> but um, yeah, isabahunt.com, there you can find pretty much everything. You can find a link to my group. You can find a link to my work, to my book. I try to keep it all in one place so people don't have to look all over the place. <laughs> Yeah, very, very cool. And uh, we'll have all those links in the show notes. So if you're driving, you don't have to swerve off the road. Um, you can just find that. <laughs> Please uh, remember, not. Remember to practice your safety. Yes, yes. safety yes. first. Um, Isabel, thank you so much, uh, not only for being on this podcast and sharing this, but doing the work seriously for, for human beings and for you know that, that wave that you were talking about and the, mm-hmm. the cleaning that I was talking about. I... I was just talking to my coach today about how I I really have this feeling like that's what I was put on this earth to do. And it's not to do alone. Like it takes light workers and people committed to this cause, like you said, till, till their death and the last dying breath. And so I honor you being thrown at us. (laughs) Hopefully stays at tomatoes. Hopefully (laughs) salads. Yeah. I think we can take a little bit more than that, but yeah, yeah I would like yeah. to keep it that way. I but yes, that. thank you so yeah. much for having me and, and allow me to share and just connecting with you and the same right back at you guys. I mean, we're on it on that um, and in that together. So Absolutely. thank you for sure. Brilliant. Isabel. All right, everyone. We'll see you on the next podcast. Have an amazing rest of your day. Bye guys.